Hello, everyone, and welcome. Welcome to our conversation today on EU-Japan relations. We'll be looking especially at this relationship within the context of developments in the Indo-Pacific. To discuss and explore these different facets of the EU-Japan relationship, I'm joined now by three wonderful scholars who've been looking at this relationship for a very long time and in great depth. Uh, let me kick off by introducing Mr. Suneo Nabe Watanabe. He's from the Sasakawa Peace Foundation in Tokyo. Nabe-san, thank you very much for joining us for this conversation or 60 minutes. Also joining us from Paris is Eva Petsova. She's Senior Japan Fellow at the Free University of Brussels, the UB. Thanks, Eva, longtime friend and colleague. It's wonderful to see you here. And last but not least, Axel Berkowski, co-head of the Asia program at the ISPI think tank in Milano and professor at Pavilla University as well. Um, some housekeeping rules. Uh, thank you very much, as I said, for joining us today. I want this to be as interactive as possible. So please do put in your questions uh, and I'll take them to the panelists. Put it in the Q&A box. And you also have the option of raising your hand uh, using the icon. And then I will give you the floor and you can ask your question in voice. Now, just a, f a few words of introduction to this rather wonderful and fascinating topic. So the Asia Pacific or the Indo-Pacific, as we like to call it now, has been called the world's most populous, dynamic and consequential region. It's a region of impressive economic growth rates, and most of the region's economies are bouncing back after the pandemic, showing quite a degree of resilience, if you like. And so the Indo-Pacific will play a crucial role in this post-pandemic economic recovery, which we hope will start taking place soon. It should be inclusive and of course, as green as possible. Now, the Indo-Pacific uh, is also a place of enormous contradictions. Um, uh, there, is, there are strategic rivalries playing out in the region and we're going to explore those and look at those in some detail in these 60 minutes. But it's not just about confrontation and competition, it's also to a large extent about cooperation, cooperation in trade and cooperation in connectivity as well. So the whole region is also, as we all know, at the moment, the place, the arena for US-China strategic rivalries. But the China is not the only country in the region. There are other very important players, India, South Korea, ASEAN, and of course, coming back to the topic uh, of our discussion today, Japan. So Nabe-san, let me turn to you and get a perspective from Tokyo, from Japan, from the Sasakawa Peace Foundation and yourself on how you see Japan interacting with its partners and its competitors in the Indo-Pacific. The screen is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for the inviting me to the, the panel. I wish I could be the blaster. Actually, I was supposed to be there the last of February, um, the last year, and the uh, COVID prevented me to. So, you know, I we we could get together sometime soon, and uh, it's a very nice timing after Quad meeting, Quad summit meeting, first uh, ever in the last Friday, and uh, that is a the kind of a good uh, hint to the what the Japan and the like-minded uh, nation would do. And uh, um, today I'd like to talk about uh, the Japan's rationale for the free and open in the Pacific uh, initiative. As you may realize that this free and open uh, uh, in Indo-Pacific uh, credited with the former prime minister Abe of Japan. And uh, uh, the, it's, a, it's a very nice, the, they, they mean that the US, uh, the Biden administration and uh, other partner continue to use uh, this uh, the concept. What concept Japan is considering? That's first of all, I think a historical, historical shift over US policy toward China. That's end of cooperative engagement since uh, the 1972, when uh, uh, Richard Nixon and Henry Kissinger visited uh, the People's Republic of China. And uh, that's containment, uh, not, not uh, um, departure from containment. And, uh, Engagement started. What is engagement? That's uh, expecting uh, uh, the, the ch if uh, China would behave uh, a more responsible player if economic uh, uh, development is achieved. And such uh, uh, expectation is not fulfilled, uh, the current US leaders. And uh, in Trump administration, uh, State Secretary Pompeo said uh, uh, engagement uh, failed. 
And the, the now Biden administration, especially the National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan agree with uh, the Pompeo's idea, somehow uh, engagement failed. However, different idea of uh, uh, the Biden administration is that they're more try to be cooperative with a like-minded partner in the region, Japan, South Korea, and in Indonesia, Australia, in India, and ASEAN. And Southeast Asian countries are very important players. So Japan continue to have uh, this kind of uh, policy already yeah, because, you know, first of all, Japan uh, uh, has a two pillar for the free and open in, in the Pacific. Pacific. One pillar is uh, realism that's uh, making a power balance uh, against the chi rising China because, you know, the deterrence uh, to the China uh, with a cooperation with the US military is a very important, but you know, that's not perfect. Also Japan is uh, the, uh, investing a lot of a liberal element that's maintaining regional order, uh, not only by power, uh, military power, but more rule-based uh, public goods. So the basically economic rule and the trade rule. So the one example is uh, uh, former Prime Minister Abe continued to pursue the TPP, uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, that is a free trade agreement. Even uh, the former uh, US President Trump got out and tried to. And also very important for the European friends, uh, Japan and the EU signed uh, the uh, Japan-EU Economic Partnership uh, Agreement, EPA, that's free trade agreement. So. That's clearly the message to the even the U.S. or even China uh, for the Japan and the Japan's uh, like-minded uh, the partner try to maintain uh, public goods in the region as free trade or, or uh, free economic uh, practice and uh, rule of law. I think uh, because of this, Japan really wanted to the expand uh, the cooperation with the European partners too. So with EPA. I think Japan signed, uh, uh, Japan and the uh, EU and the EU member countries signed up uh, SPA. That's not so uh, popular among even the Europeans and the Japanese. Uh, if you, we, we ask the who, do you know the EP, SPA? Probably not many people answer. I'm, I'm sure Axel would explain what's going on. But, uh, you know, SPA is actually the Japan and the EU signed. Uh, uh, July 2018, and uh, um, you know the uh, SPA uh, stated agreement to, will serve as a legal basis for the promoting a cooperation and the matter of a mutual interest. Blah blah blah. And uh, uh, I think uh, Japan, Japan and the EU and the member states share values and the principle of democracy, rule of law, human rights, and fundamental freedoms. That's keyword for the why the Japan and the EU cooperate uh, the the several area, not only the security but uh, uh, the economic area too. By the way, the such kind of a similar words can find in the very recent first Quad summit uh, between uh, Japanese leader, U.S. leader, and the Indian leader and Australian leader. I think a joint statement says that. Together, we commit to promoting a free, open rule-based order rooted in uh, international law to, um, to advance security and uh, prosperity and the counter threat to both in the Indo-Pacific and beyond. And we support the rule of law. So I think uh, you, you can find very commonality. And that's clearly the Japan's aspiration for the cooperation with a European country not only with Asian neighbors, that's not containment for China. That's clearly sending a message to China, follow the, let's follow the uh, common rule. I'll stop here. Nabisan, if I could just uh, question you a little bit further on that. So you've said that this is about uh, not just cooperation on military grounds, also promoting a liberal rules-based order and public goods, which are you know safety at sea and uh, mm. trade, et cetera. But mm -hmm. this Quad Summit that's just been held, I mean, it's 
focusing very much on rules-based human rights democracy, words are important, but where's the beef? What are you, uh, are these court countries bringing to the table in terms of alternatives to mm. what perhaps, since this is supposed to be a kind of China focused mm. uh, pushback uh, initiative, mm. what are you bringing mm. to the table, which is different or mm. better than what mm. China is bringing to the table? Yeah, I think uh, that this time uh, beef is a uh, vaccine. <laughs> <laughs> it's vaccine. So, uh, is it? China is uh, promoting a vac vaccination and uh, it's not counter, but uh, clearly try to the good competition for the, the regional public goods. I think, and also cyber security, climate change, many things are the good beef for, uh, that's not uh, just taking a one beef uh, and the competition for the China versus others. No, we can cooperate in the case, in some case. And the case would be climate change among others, I suppose. Right, that's right. And also, well, at the same time, we, we really want China to understand. China is a now the, the too much assertive the action and the, the cause of so anxiety among the nations and among the neighbors. And the China really need to understand that somehow it's self-destructive because the China is a benefit. China is benefiting from the common common rule and the economic uh, uh, the prosperity. Right, and of course, uh, all countries in the region except India, which is a member of the Quad, are in the RCEP as well, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, which includes many countries in the region except India, includes China. Uh, yeah. You know, Japan, Japan really very hard to pursue the, to include India in the RCEP. Mm -hmm. And uh, unfortunately, India didn't follow. But you know, that's good. India is a kind of a quite independent players. And everybody watching India plays India's game. That's okay. And now India joined, uh, joined the Quad to, to somehow sending signal to China. That's right. more possible for the, anybody in the, living in the Indo-Pacific region. Thank you very much, Navisan, for giving us that point of view. Axel, let me turn to you now. Um, you've been watching and reporting and writing and analyzing EU-Japan relations for a very, very long time. Um, do you see a sudden kind of, let's say, reinforcement of this relationship, uh, first under the Trump administration, where the EU and Japan signed the EPA and the SPA, and that was clearly a sign that multilateralism lives on, uh, despite Trump's withdrawal from many, many multilateral commitments? And do you see this relationship now becoming even more strategic and politically uh, relevant in, in, in these very, very, let's say, um, geopolitically tense times? Thank you, Shada. And thank you, Shada, for, for inviting me. Also, of course, thank you to the EPC. Good to be back again every once in a while. And um, uh, I don't have little, little time, so I don't have you know more time to thank everybody, but uh, good to be back. Yes, of course. I mean, uh, Watanabe-san already introduced us in, into the topic already. And I think the instruments are all there. The, e the EPA uh, is there and we have the SPA, which was adopted in 2018, you know, uh, listing 40 areas of, of, of EU-Japan cooperation, ranging from conflict management, counterterrorism, non-proliferation of WMD, transfer control of conventional weapons, uh, climate change, maritime security, corruption, organized crimes, money laundering, cyber security, so on and so forth. And of course, uh, the Indo-Pacific, and I will come back to this, uh, is of course part of the equation. And, you know, and as you said, rightly, uh, Shada, you know, the, the Trump administration, of course, have, uh, has, um, you know, f you know, given, given the EU and Japan further incentive to, uh, further incentives to, to, to adopt the agreements very, very quickly and put some, put some beef um, um, to the agreement and actually do something together. You know, something we've all, we've, you know, we've all been part of the equation in the, in the discussion, Watanabe-san and, and Eva and, and you, Shada, that, you know, lots of talk and you know, lots of action plans, lots of areas of cooperation, but very little follow-up. And I think this seems to be, uh, this seems to be uh, different now. And uh, also to, uh, also because of what uh, Watanabe-san said um, earlier. You know, we have all these uh, areas. We have priorities now. We have connectivity, physical and digital. And that's, of course, also very important for the Indo-Pacific. We have um, the second um, priority, not surprising, uh, as usual, effective multilateralism. It needs to be followed up, of course, with, uh, with, with actions on the ground. And there is something later on. Climate and, and environment mentioned before. There, there's, there's, there are things going on on the ground. Um, security. OK, I'll come back to this later. Security in the Asia-Pacific, in the Indo-Pacific, in, you know, in the framework of the Quad, because there 
also European countries like France and the UK, uh, which you know, which are thinking about joining the Quad as, as informal members. You know, and this is of course not EU Japan per se, but it's certainly related. The fifth um, priority, maybe it's the uh, maybe the uh, the odd man out. The UN reform always reappears on the agenda, but uh, what the EU uh, and Japan can do to reform the UN um, is not quite clear to me yet. So let's move on to things that the EU um, and Japan can do something about and are doing something about in the Indo-Pacific. September 2019, we go back a little bit, Brussels and Tokyo adopted the EU-Japan partnership on sustainable co connectivity and quality infrastructure. This, so this is very, very important. The EU and Japan putting funds together putting resources together and getting engaged in, in joint quality infrastructure um, projects on the ground. That, of course, is in South Asia, where India becomes into the equation in Southeast Asia and Africa and elsewhere. Uh, and this is backed up by a 60 billion uh, euro EU guarantee fund. So there's also money, money available to do uh, things together. Uh, and if you look at the, uh, at the project, if you look at what Japan is already doing alone on the ground in terms of quality infrastructure, it, it already is very, very impressive. I and mean, when you look at the kind of projects, uh, there are indeed many projects the EU can um, uh, directly uh, contribute to because, you know, the EU and Japan really are on the same page in, uh, and are getting things done. Maybe not the kind of stuff in cooperation shutter that is that is being reported in the FT and the Economist because it's technical, it's maybe it's a little bit boring, um, but it's there. So they are doing things on the ground. Uh, officially, of course, uh, um, EU Japan uh, quality infrastructure um, in relation to connectivity um, has nothing to do with the um, with the, with the Chinese BRI. It's not a you know it's not a counter initiative. It's not meant there to. Uh, to, uh, to send a message to the Chinese that uh, we are doing things better, more transparently, um, um, more environmentally friendly, financially sustainable, so on and so forth. But in reality, it is, you know, because if you look at the, uh, at, uh, at the, at the fundamentals of how the EU and Japan in the framework of the SPA want to adopt those, um, those initiatives, you know, they, they talked about like, uh, like what, what Anaba San said earlier about, you know, rules-based connectivity, um, free and open trade, uh, mutually beneficial relationship, so on and so forth, no debt trap diplomacy, um, no exclusive access. So the fact of what, the, what Japan and the EU are doing on the ground already in Asia is, um, you know, fundamentally, I, I would argue, maybe that's debatable, the very opposite of how China is um, adopting its infrastructure, infrastructure uh, development projects in the region. So there, there, there's uh, uh, certainly a lot of uh, cooperation already going on um, on the ground. And, you know, we, maybe we, we could talk about this. I'll go on a little bit, shall if I may, for yes, two or three minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, two. Yeah, sure, of course, <laughs> Too of course, of course. <laughs> After a three year interval, uh, uh, the EU and, and Japan have resumed also talking um, about um, uh, cooperating in the area of hard security. On the agenda, and that of course is again important for and relevant for the Indo Pacific, jointly contributing to maritime security that is already taking pl place uh, within 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 limits. Maritime domain awareness very important. The US uh, is is, uh, is is interested in this. Uh, anti piracy measures has been done in the past, will be done in the future. Joint port calls along the Horn of Africa. Joint capacity building initiatives in Vietnam, Indonesia, and other countries in Southeast Asia. You know, this is still early stages. Maybe uh, Eva will talk about this too, but it's on the agenda. To be sure, as we know, when things are on the agenda in Brussels or in Tokyo, it doesn't mean that, uh, that all of this will be implemented soon. But the instrument uh, with the SPA and the other action plans the EU has adopted, and uh, uh, like the, uh, the EU uh, action plan entitled EU Security Cooperation in and with Asia, you know, cooperation foreseen with a lot of countries in Southeast Asia, um, but none of this is exclusive. Japan has is, is always been invited to, uh, to be part um, of, of the equation. So there is a lot of things, there are a lot of things going on on the ground already, um, you know, um, in, in the context of, uh, of the SPA. Sure, the devil is always um, in the details, but, uh, but I think we are off um, for, for a good start as, as regards uh, concrete um, cooperation on the ground and the SPA uh, is certainly the instrument uh, um, that is uh, relevant 
for mm -hmm. this kind of cooperation. Sh thank Absolutely. you, Shara. Very much. Thank you very much indeed, Axel. In fact, it's quite interesting that the Japanese foreign minister took part in the EU foreign minister's meeting in, in January as well. And so there is this consultation process that has actually accelerated. And I think mm -hmm. the conversations are deepening and broadening. Um, just a very quick uh, follow up for you, Axel, but also something that Navisan, I'd like you to think about before I go to Eva. Um, a few days ago, I was in a conference with the president of Ghana. Uh, it was organized uh, by uh, Konrad Adenauer Stiftung, and it was a very, very fascinating conversation about EU uh, Africa relations. And one thing that he said, which I think was quite resonating uh, for me, was he said, you know, when we uh, look at uh, the partners who are working with us, our uh, priority is infrastructure, he said. And that's where China has the upper hand compared to many other countries because they can come in and use their own experience and in, uh, infrastructure. And his, um, interestingly, he said, you know, what we want is countries to stop saying we're better than you or you're better than us and stop this and actually work together uh, on uh, questions of African interests, which at the moment is very much building infrastructure. So um, I'm going to move to Eva, but do mm -hmm. think about this and, and tell me what you think. If there's really anything that EU and Japan uh, can be doing uh, in a concrete fashion, uh, perhaps with, with China or perhaps without China, but still working very closely together when it comes to African uh, development. Yes. Okay, um, thank you. Eva, let me turn to you now. So in the Pacific, the EU um, is quite late in coming to the game. Uh, Netherlands, France and Germany already have their Indo-Pacific strategies. And of course, the rest of the world has been talking about Indo-Pacific rather than Asia Pacific for a few years. But it is coming to the table. Um, it has some ideas. Joseph Borrell, the high representative, uh, has a blog that came out about two days ago, which talks about a three strand or two strand strategy towards the region. Um, give us a little bit of your insights on how this conversation is developing uh, within EU capitals and in, in Brussels. Well, thank you very much, Adam. Many thanks to EPC for, for inviting me. It's great to see all the familiar places, same as uh, my colleagues. Indeed, uh, well, the EU is, a, is certainly a latecomer into the Indo-Pacific debate. In fact, it still doesn't have a strategy as we speak. <clears throat> we hope to have one probably around May, June this year. But if it is a latecomer, that, that certainly doesn't mean that it was not interested or concerned uh, by the regional security developments for a very long time. But as many of those countries that I call uh, stuck in the middle, uh, we were a little bit cautious, uh, let's say, to, to take sides in, in, in this perceivingly polarizing debate, uh, which is driven mainly by the uh, US-China rivalry, and, and let's say taking our time. I think it's uh, also uh, testifying well about the internal, vi very vibrant internal debate that was taking place inside the EU among its member states. And, and to me, it's uh, very much reflecting a, a little bit of an internal process of soul searching of the EU as a security and foreign policy actor as well. You know, we're looking for this European way, as the um, high representative uh, called it, our way. Now, that is, of course, no longer the case. We are uh, going to have a strategy or outlook. It's partly uh, a result of this bottom up pressure uh, from the member states. So it was no longer France who had its own uh, obvious interests and, and very valid ones, but it was mostly afterwards driven by the German and the Dutch uh, outlooks guidelines uh, that have been explicitly pushing for a Europe common European stance. But it's also reflecting the, the realization that the Indo-Pacific debate has grown beyond its geographical limits. Uh, in many ways, whether we like it or not, it really has become a synonymous to this battle between values, uh, liberal democracies versus auto autocracies, autocracies, uh, revisionism, uh, between the rule of law and the lack of it, between cooperative security and, and, and more of a unilateral approaches that the EU eventually realized it cannot afford to stay to stay aside. So what uh, we know will be certainly uh, part of the, the strategy, what could be this European way in the Indo-Pacific? Um, thematically, well, we know the, the kind of obvious DNA uh, when it comes to European engagement is always to focus on transnational security issues, is to focus on multilateralism, multilateral cooperation, cooperative security and rules-based solutions. When it comes to the functional areas, maritime security, connectivity, trade and global issues are the four pillars 
Uh, this is something that we can be sure of. And I would love to, well, you know, I have a maritime security bias, so I won't be getting too much into details on maritime security, but uh, I think it's a very good uh, example of concrete engagement of something that Europe has been doing for a very long time and that I think will be put more into uh, practice in this new context. Uh, the focus on those nitty gritty functional everyday uh, issues that tend to be ignored uh, and largely overlooked in, in, in a lot of these interstate rivalries, uh, strategic debates. So functional cooperation, maritime domain awareness, anti-piracy, Axel already mentioned quite a few of that, law enforcement, maritime safety. This is all things that we have been working, we want to say EU has been working on with its Asian partners, with ASEAN, with Japan for a very long time. Uh, connectivity, obviously, uh, well, the EU has its uh, connectivity strategy from 2018. It's, it's pretty much a shell if you want, but uh, it, it will be a main focus uh, in cooperation with uh, other partners, Japan at the forefront with the EU-Japan um, partnership on sustainable connectivity. We just need to put more meat in. But I understood that there has been uh, a very um, active debate between the EU and Japan on, on most development projects in Africa. Um, we'll see where that goes. Trade, obviously, uh, you highlighted the COVID, post-COVID conflict uh, context, supply chain, supply chain uh, security and resilience seems to be one of the uh, issues that have been, has been highlighted by the two uh, governments and, and is something in progress. And finally, the global issues that, uh, again, are often overlooked and one area where we can also engage in, with China, climate change, health security, environmental uh, issues, you name it, of course. Now the partners, when we say like-minded partners, Japan is the, the topic of uh, today, but uh, uh, Axel mentioned this, this key project enhancing security in and with Asia. So just to uh, you know, uh, show who are the main partners is Japan, Korea, Indonesia, India, Singapore, and Vietnam. Singapore has been uh, added very, very lately. So the idea is precisely, and here I would just like to follow up on what Axel and, and, and what Anabesan said, um, is to put the beef on. Uh, that's the, the really suddenly, the, it's not the realization, we know that for a long time, but it was difficult to put it together, is to get our act together and operationalize some of those, uh, you know, talks. We'll see where it goes. The, the four strands of cooperation is maritime security, cybersecurity, crisis management. Um, what's it? Yeah, I missed one. Uh, and um, yeah, so we'll, we'll see where it goes. It started last year and obviously given the, the current constraints, uh, it's very difficult to do some of those uh, concrete uh, activities on the ground. So unfortunately, the, the current um, pandemics have slowed down a, a little bit, but the realization is there. I'll just conclude with some of the tricks because you asked us at the beginning to think out of the box. Not sure to how to what extent it's really out of the box, but just my few um, tips and tricks on how to really do move things a little bit forward. It's um, it's greater degree of flexibility uh, when it comes to engagement. We talk a lot about the quad. Uh, we talk and then we get stuck often uh, in this, you know, why or who and to what extent we should join the quad and what it means and and and, and there's unnecessarily sometimes uh, a lot of the baggage that, that goes with those concepts. So when I say flexibility, I mean uh, trying to uh, really focus on what needs to be done effectively. So whether it can be done more uh, or better in, in a bilateral setting, be it whether it can be minilateral, trilateral uh, or, 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 or multilateral, fine, and nothing is really mutually exclusive. Uh, because when we talk about, let's say, maritime security, so many different issues or connectivity, we can work together with India and Japan on, on supply chains with Australia, India and Japan, um, et cetera, et cetera. And really none of it needs to be uh, formalized or, or kind of clearly defined as long as we manage to get our act together. Um, so yeah, try to not get mm -hmm. stuck in, in concept. And the second and that's maybe a little bit too far away, but I, that's my own personal uh, pet issue lately, 
I think Europe can be an added value in the Indo-Pacific uh, debate because um, there are few things that, from its experience, that you can learn from its Russia and Eastern neighborhood uh, engagement. I always say that Europe could be a bridge between Eurasia and the Indo-Pacific. And there's a lot of issues that we see across this continental axis and the maritime axis, which is the Indo-Pacific, which is extensively discussed, that we don't discuss enough. And I believe also with Japan, there are things that, uh, or comparisons or lessons learned or whatever you call it, that we have learned uh, and keep learning and, and keep exercising in our experience with Russia and Eastern neighborhood that maybe we can share with our Japanese and uh, Eastern uh, Asian colleagues to address some of the common concerns in the Indo-Pacific. I'll end to her. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Eva. So I have a couple of questions coming in, but just before I turn to, to the questions, just very quickly for you, because you talked about the, uh, the various sort of, let's say, differences and distinctions between liberal democracies and autocracies or authoritarian regimes. Um, the EU has a choice, I guess, uh, whether to fall into the court uh, concept, which is um, anti-China bias or, you know, a pushback or the ASEAN outlook, which is much more about being inclusive. Um, and I was uh, wondering which way you think, um, I have my own views, but which way you think um, the EU is going to, uh, going to swing, if you like. Well, I mean, the, the first from the top of my head, I would say the ASEAN way. <laughs> That's, uh, it seems um, quite obvious. Uh, you could see also uh, a, a direct shift, actually, uh, you see, could see the impact after ASEAN released its Indo-Pacific outlook. I think that was one of the first turning point, actually, on the European uh, policymaker circles to realize that this is, you know, call it the, the Indo-Pacific term does not have to be uh, US versus China or does not have to have this subtext. Um, the moment that ASEAN joined, and, and, and if you look at the, at the outlook, it really is about all multilateral um, solutions, cooperative security, inclusiveness and engagement. It does not even explicitly mention the, the US-China rivalry. That was something that suddenly, I think, got the European hearts closer to the debates and it's really where where this is all leaning much more than uh the the quad uh side again this is not a black and white conversation and and of course i can imagine that some european member states would perhaps uh vote for that but if we talk about a consensus and then the eu level then it would be closer to the asean one because it also preserves ASEAN centrality in, in the entire conversation, which has always been a big priority for not just ASEAN, but for many of its close partners. And that um, was one of the cr big criticisms that we had uh, of the concept at the beginning of the, of the US strategy. It was not mentioning ASEAN uh, enough. And that's something that uh, we agree with our Japanese colleagues that really ASEAN should be put back and highlighted as the center of, of regional affairs. Right. So uh, I do have a question for all of you that I've put to you, which is about Africa. But I have a question here from Hervé Delphin, who is head of policy planning at the External Action Service. Hervé, would you like to voice your question or do you want me to put it to you? It's, um, it's uh, put it to the panelists. Um, it's, uh, it's up to you. Nathalie, can you see if Hervé is happy to voice his question? Okay. Okay, I'll, uh, uh, if it's, yeah. Yeah, Hervé, please. Oh, okay, so you, he says that his- uh, Hello, 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 ah, hi, there you sorry. Are. Great, thought, go ahead, Hervé, vas-y. I, I, I thought that my audio system was disabled. Um, no, so my, my question somehow, um, uh, Shala, you, you, you put it because it was relating to a recent um, a survey on the state of, uh, of the Southeast Asia who has been released and all uh, key uh, opinion makers and leaders from various uh, sectors uh, put uh, Japan and EU as the two most trusted uh, partners for ASEAN countries, <clears throat> um, way above, you know, US and China, for, for both of which we are increasingly uh, seen as, uh, uh, you know, in a, in a rivalry and therefore uh, partners are hedging. Hence the question basically is more or less the same that you just put uh, out now. Uh, Shada was uh, 
would you see an opportunity for an EU, Japan, ASEAN triangle next and complementary to the Quad? In other words, uh, whether Japan and EU should focus their uh, joint work on working with ASEAN. And there is a broader question, and of course, I'm fully involved in preparing this Indo-Pacific uh, strategy, is what would you see as the most effective and economic and security regional architectures in Indo-Pacific, which uh, uh, as a, one of characteristics, it, it lacks a stable regional order. So that's the reason why also we are so much in trouble. So that's the second question is a bit broader, but uh, the first one is very, very specific. Over. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hervé. Uh, on the regional security architecture, um, uh, I would say that somehow uh, the region has managed to uh, avoid confrontation on a big scale and to avoid adversarial uh, relationships without having a NATO. So there is something to be said about the ASEAN way. Uh, and all the different informal conversations that they have, um, including, of course, the East Asia Summit, where we are still pending uh, invitation. But let me turn to the panel. Uh, Nabe-san, uh, first uh, you, please. Unmute, yeah. All right, yeah. Thank you. Um, nice question, good question. And the, actually, the, I, I'd like to answer the both. Uh, so, uh, Ms. Mr. Delphine's uh, question and also uh, I think uh, the previous question, uh, Africa too, Africa question too, that because it's uh, overlapping. Uh, somehow the, uh, the ASEAN country is, is, doesn't want to be forced to choose either China or United States. But at the same time, they really wanted to have opportunity for the economic development cooperation. So big chunk either Japan and the EU. And also Japan and EU both actually appreciated the, the democratic rule and also appreciated the ASEAN way. I think the uh, uh, same thing may apply to the African countries too. So somehow that doesn't mean that they just uh, give up uh, the good economic cooperation, uh, development cooperation from China. They want both. That's okay, of course. So I think uh, the framework kind of Japan, EU, ASEAN sometimes works, but it cannot be the permanent framework or some uh, legit framework. Um, um, same thing apply for the Quad. Quad cannot be permanent uh, framework such as uh, NATO. I think, uh, you know, probably the, the major reason is that ASEAN, uh, that means the Southeast Asian, country doesn't want to be the fixed framework or the, they really wanted to have a, their own freedom to choose. So sometimes a very difficult work for even for the China or United States to do their own sphere of influence. But you know, with a cooperation, Japan or Quad or European country, somehow easier for the either China or United States to the, the get into the some, somehow the, the development. I think that same thing may apply to the African countries too. And first of all, um, uh, Prime Minister Abe's idea of a free and open uh, in the Pacific came from a uh, uh, first uh, TICAT, TICAT meeting. TICAT is a uh, um, the Tokyo International Cooperation African Development. That's clearly the Japan's target is not only Asian country, but also the African country too. Well, no, what Japan can do is very limited, of course, financially and politically. So EU is a, one of the prime target, a prime uh, candidate for the cooperation. So the EPA and SPA, Japan and e EU, is a clearly foundation for the such kind of a very the the creative thinking to the what we do provide to the the goods in ASEAN or Africa. Okay, Nabisan, on uh, on the quad, if it just very quickly, um, uh, as far as I can tell, it's quite a limited uh, number of countries. I mean, one major power that is missing is South Korea. The, isn't it? Um, and if I'm not mistaken, Japan has some hesitation or wariness 
about yeah i think uh, japan is not japan 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 is not japanese government is <laughs> <laughs> okay, because, you, know, I just atten- you know i just attended the, the japan south korean parliamentary exchange uh, two days ago and gave a talk to the south korean hey why not cooperate between japan and the south korea in the day of uh, uh, serious uh, competition between the uh, united states and china the, I think uh, that makes sense for the Korean people too. Yeah. But uh, you know, unfortunately, domestic politics. So actually, the, the good chance is uh, now the uh, President Biden really have a big, strong push to the both Japan and South Korea to include uh, such a cooperative uh, uh, framework. Right. Thank you very much. So Axel, uh, let's go to you with Thank the you. question that was put by Hervé Delphin and, uh, and my own. Thank you. Thank you, Shada, and thank you also, Hervé. Thank you for my nice meeting you. Um, I don't want to spoil the party for anybody and the ASEAN way, um, but EU, Japan, ASEAN, you know, another duplication, you know, creating another another title for something. I mean, we already have, I mean, Eva talked about this and I talked about this myself. We have the 2019 plan, EU, Japan, sorry, yeah, the EU, um, EU plan for, for, for the Asia Pacific, for the Indo Pacific. Then we have a lot of Southeast Asian ASEAN countries already uh, included. And, you know, and, and we have an EU Japan action plan, you know, so we could, of course, you know, the EU Japan can invite, uh, you know, um, selected countries to contribute to selected um, projects without maybe LV, you know, um, and Shadam, without, you know, calling it an EU Japan ASEAN tri- triangle. You know, I'm, I'm not sure whether this is, this is, uh, uh, this is um, putting a lot of beef to 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 what is what is going on. So let's not uh, maybe you know let's not. That's my advice. Let's not duplicate and create you know more acronyms. Um, you know uh, because everything is already in place. We have all the instruments in place, and uh, I I would say so. Uh, sure, ASEAN is invited. To ASEAN countries, Southeast Asian countries are invited to to join. And there's a lot of you know. EFA has, has has got all the details. There's a lot of um, a beef on on uh, you know a lot of meat on the table already. Or beef, if you will. The second one, uh, the second issue, if I may, very very quickly, the Quad. Uh, of course, the Quad is about containing China, and you know, and, and, it, and it better be about containing China, and, and it is, uh, you know, Australia, the U.S., Japan, and, and in your containing China, and there's no doubt about this. And I and I would very much welcome, and I'm I'm not a you know hardline militarist uh, um, scholar, you know, propagating you know confrontation, but you know, I would be very happy to see the uh, the Brits and the French and the Germans maybe also joining the quad, uh, joining uh, the, uh, the attempt to, uh, to keep China's uh, territorial ambitions in, in check. Because the ASEAN way uh, has not you know, kept China from building military bases from indisputed islands in the South China Sea, which is ongoing. So if there's anybody who could do something about this, um, and of course they're not doing it really, uh, but it's, it's certainly in you know, a grouping of countries with the US and, and, and Joe Biden seems to be, or the US administration seems to be much more open to, towards uh, um, you know, at least attempting to, to contain China's uh, territorial ambitions. And, and, and this is where, where the Europe, I mean, I've, I've, I've been talking to, to, to French officials and, and UK British officials on this, and they are happy to um, well, happy. They they would be prepared to join um, such uh, groupings in an informal manner, if you will. You know, if um, but you know, but there is certainly room for cooperation, and um, whether whether it's institutionalized or whether it's informal, but somebody needs to do something about China. You know, about Chinese territorial ambitions. I'm, you know, I mean, these are the facts on the ground, or not? Or am I wrong? Or am I seeing things? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, indeed, Axel. Eva, let's go to you. Sure. Um, I think it, it joins a, a lot of th- things that we mentioned, joins my, my idea about flexible engagement uh, in a way. Of course, um, I, I've been very pleased to see the, the survey that uh, Hervé is mentioning on, uh, on ASEAN's preferences on, on most trusted partners. But what has been really the greatest criticism towards at least the EU uh, from coming from us and was the was the lack of action. So, um, you know, you can be a trusted partner somewhere out there, but really hoping that, you know, you, you are going to deliver on your promises is something that we need to work on. And when I was mentioning about flexible engagement, I believe that uh, in, in areas such as connectivity, typically, the EU and Japan can join forces with ASEAN on projects. And this would be, you know, the, the sort of concrete delivery that would at the same time prove that uh, maybe ASEAN countries were right to trust us. 
um, and, and provide um, a kind of change on the ground. So connectivity, uh, maritime security, cyber, uh, various kind of institutional integration, confidence building measure, Japan is extremely active. Uh, of course, uh, in you know building confidence of Philippines, Vietnam, these are the same partners that we have, and I believe that there is definitely scope for cooperation. But it would be difficult. We, we really need to pick the battles. I mean, there's there's certain amount of issues that you can address with ASEAN, and then with the individual countries, and it would not necessarily be always the same, and not to a certain degree of, of operational effectiveness, if you want. So that's on the ASEAN. And uh, on, on regional security architecture, I think it joins, it kind of brings me back to my PhD. This is just so, so many debates that we had on, on the ASEAN way on effectiveness of, of, of the ongoing regional order. Uh, I think uh, Shada is right in saying that uh, we, we cannot be, uh, you know, it, it is a region that has been existing in, in and evolving and making its proofs in, in, in the current uh, institutional structures it has. It has the ASEAN Regional Forum, it has the ASEAN Defense Ministers Meeting, Meeting Plus. There are so many different uh, agglutinative structures that somehow manage to, to keep the, the, the regional order in check and, and somehow protects it also you know, uh, from those quads and US-China rivalries on, on the other hand. I don't think it would be too ambitious, basically, to trying to, you know, uh, try to reform everything and, and make from scratch. We need to respect all the efforts uh, and all the ongoing efforts um, that have been done in the region. They have, they exist for a reason. They have the current shape they have and structures and, and ways of cooperation for a reason because countries did not feel ready to do more or, or, or want to do it this way and I think we need to respect it and so far uh, I think it has done a, a pretty decent job um, we can always be critical uh, but you know uh, I think it's, it, it, it's fine and we should try to support those structures rather than reform them Thank you very much, Eva. I'm happy to take a few more questions from uh, the audience. So please uh, either raise your hand or, or send me a question on the Q&A uh, icon. Let me just turn now to a question. And Eva, you know, um, you've said let's let's uh, not try and reinvent the wheel in a Western way, in a sense, is what you're saying, because some of the architecture or the or the formats that exist are doing pretty well. OK, they may not meet our high standards of how things should be. Everything should be, you know, um, rules and obligatory and uh, consensus is, uh, is perhaps one way that the ASEAN has shown that it is a resilient organization worthy of more uh, respect and perhaps even um, relevance, more relevant today than ever before where many countries are trying to avoid this binary trap. But I do want to come to a question which is been pointed out by all of you, which is connectivity. And there, like it or not, we have rival competitive ideas there. There's the ASEAN Master Plan, Free and Open Indo-Pacific, we have the Belt and Road Initiative, and we have the Turkish ideas, Russian ideas, American as well, and then of course the EU's connectivity strategy. Do you not think, um, in the interest of efficiency and also, uh, let's say, in, in the interest of actually doing something rather than just talking about it, it's time to connect the connectivities and to have a multilateral or a plurilateral format where people actually, as the African president was saying, the uh, president of Ghana was saying, work together rather than as competitors and rivals. Um, I was just wondering, uh, Nabisan, if you'd like to uh, respond to that question and then I'll turn to Eva and Axel. Thank you. Thank you for the question. That's actually one thing I forgot to mention about uh, uh, the recent Quad uh, Summit achievement. If you find the statement, several interesting statements, including uh, respect of the uh, centrality of uh, ASEAN. That means a US president um, joined, of course, statement, respect uh, ASEAN centrality. And also, uh, um, I think a result of uh, the, uh, the quad was explained by the national U.S. Ne national Sec Security Advisor Saliban in the, in the website, uh, talking about uh, some kind of division of uh, labor uh, for the providing a vac vac vaccine to the Indo-Pacific region. Is uh, 
um, the, I think asking India to promote and expand their own production of a vaccine. And the Japan and the United States have financially helped India to increase uh, uh, the, the production of a vaccine. And uh, Australia is uh, working on the, uh, distributing uh, vaccine, vaccine, vaccine to the region. Of course, that's kind of a model. I, I don't know how it would be implemented. But um, I think uh, this kind of thing, the division of labor with uh, several country for the, the common public goods is good. And uh, somehow that, that would be the, the not counter against the Chinese effort to the vaccination distribution and the WHO uh, based on the COVAX, the effort too. I think uh, clearly the major nation already contributed a lot to the COVAX too. So, that, that's good for the recipient for the vaccine because the vaccine is not the zero sum one. Uh, and, and the competition for this is a good. I think the same thing may apply to the infrastructure development too. I think uh, um, like-minded nation and uh, or either uh, international existing organization or, or I think uh, uh, either work or sometimes both work, of course, um, you know, the, this kind of a project is uh, taking a longer time. So uh, avoiding uh, the conflict is uh, relatively easy, right? Avoid, avoiding unnecessary finance is easy because uh, basically the financial source is uh, very limited too. Anyway, this kind of competition makes uh, the better and uh, taking uh, some hearts of uh, ASEAN people or African people. That's, as a picture, it's okay. And for practical level, just starting. And the quad is a kind of a starting to starting point to the actual uh, the proceed um, the actual practice. Thank you very much indeed uh, to increase production of vaccines in India. But India's major demand uh, is to have a waiver on protection of intellectual property for the production of vaccines. Actually, get that waiver through the WHO WTO. And I do not see if I'm under unless I'm mistaken any support for that, either from Japan or the European Union for the moment, that is considered to be uh, something that we cannot actually change. Am I, am I wrong in this? This is going to be, a, this could be a, a, a big breakthrough if this is done, but it doesn't seem to be on the cards, I think, at the moment. Right, Nabisan? Nabisan? Uh, yeah, that, that, that's a very good point. That's one of the reasons the big test is ongoing. You know, the, Many people already said that the Quad already the successful in uh, showing a picture concept, but uh, not the real cooperation, uh, uh, the result. That's uh, the very big test, especially the vaccination is a serious. If a successful, very effective. If not, probably very disappointing. The real mm -hmm. test is uh, just a study. So you, 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 uh, you, your question on the procedure is a pre pretty much a legitimate question. Thank you very much. Axel. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it sounds very good, you know, and I can understand the uh, the Ghanaian president saying, you know, why don't you all work together and build hospitals and schools here in, in Ghana? No, he didn't talk about hospitals and schools. He was talking about bridges and ports. And, okay, and, fair enough. And 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 okay, but it's, it's the same thing. And of course, you know, yes, of course. Uh, and there is, of course, you know, and I don't want to be dismissive or anything like this. I try to be positive now. And I, as you will hear in a second, I mean, there is you and Japan, sorry, uh, China and Japan, they have resigned, you know, a memorandum of understanding a couple of years ago that Japan and, and China are in principle prepared to work together, or the Japan in principle is, is, is open to contributing to selected BRI projects, you know, if there are certain conditions in place. The problem is that the conditions are not in place. If you look at the, uh, <laughs> the Japanese conditions and the preconditions, uh, it's very difficult for, for 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 Japanese contractors to get the to receive the go ahead from the government to uh, contribute to, to to those projects, you know. And then you know, and again, it sounds positive in, in in principle, but in practice, it's probably difficult. I've talked to, and maybe that's the interesting part of what, what I was saying now is that I've talked to a couple of Chinese contractors on the ground, and they and they said, look, we would be very happy to work with the Japanese 
because they know how to make money, you know, because Japan has been doing infrastructure development, you know, for decades all over the place, including in Europe. So they, they know they know how to, to make a buck. And, and the Chinese, often the state-owned enterprise giants, they go there, come what may, uh, very deep pockets, but do not make any money because it's all about political, it's a political project more than an economically viable project. Um, uh, but there are lots of stumbling blocks to, um, to concrete, um, you know, cooperation on the ground because of the preconditions. Maybe Japan can be more flexible. Maybe the, the Europeans can be more flexible. But I don't think this is really taking place. You know, uh, unless uh, there are fundamental changes. But I, but I think um, memorandum of understanding, okay. But on the ground, maybe that's uh, you know not uh, not being adopted or implemented. So actually, walking the talk is is proving to be, as often is the case, more complicated than uh, imagined. Mm. Right. Thank you very much indeed, Axel. Uh, Eva, mm. please. Yes. Well, connecting connectivity, I can, I would kind of tend to agree with what Axel said. You know, it's 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 a nice idea, but then on the ground, things are a little bit different. When you mentioned the multilateralizing, mm. let's say connectivity, I believe there is a, actually a multilateral organization that looks at connectivity, and it's ASEM. Awesome for uh, two years now. I mean, there has been efforts to kind of bring those uh, ideas together. But the problem is that, of course, we, we stumble upon agreeing what we mean, what is the, what is the rule of the game, uh, you know, the notions of transparency and win-win and, and, uh, and, and sustainability and economic and environmental and human sustainability, that's all fine. But the more you include uh, around the table, the less it is uh, easy to, to, to agree on, on a common definition. And that's the very basis, the very problem of multilateralism. The reason why um, the president of Ghana or you know, so many European countries or, or the Balkan countries uh, have been so happy to have uh, quick uh, bridges and, and railroads and, and, and tunnels uh, is precisely because uh, China did not necessarily wait for any multilateral uh, or, or any, you know, broader uh, merger, but went and did it. And, and this is, you know, uh, kind of, I, I believe, and it's a private sector in a way. I mean, that's a natural jungle of competitivity between uh, between those projects. And it's an organic um, world in a way. I don't think that there is a point. I mean, I see the idea of, oh, we have so many connectivity bridges, let's do something together. But when we look a little bit further, you realize that there are things that are difficult to be regulated. And I believe it's still an emerging jungle. Eventually, one day, perhaps we will see a pattern um but so far that's that's the way it goes i guess thank you very much indeed as i said in a in a column i wrote earlier uh, this year which is the indo-pacific is uh, complicated and no easy solution for the many complicated and complex relationships there we are in treacherous waters but i think the start of this eu japan uh, partnership uh, in the region would be a good step forward and as herve said there is vast potential to work in tandem uh, with other countries in the region, including, of course, ASEAN. And I would also insist, if I may, uh, in concluding this session, that somehow we tend to forget South Asia. South Asia, India is not, China is not Asia and India is not South Asia. There are many countries in the region with very high uh, economic growth rates, which should also be participating in any initiatives or any strategy that has evolved for the region. So if it is going to be inclusive, uh, it has to also look at the other countries in the region and not just the mammoths, uh, whether it's uh, containing China or uh, actually promoting uh, a port, which includes some of the major countries in the region. So uh, I would like to thank you very much indeed, all of you for joining this conversation of actually explaining some very complicated uh, issues that are there. Geopolitics lives on uh, and geopolitics lives on more than ever before in the Indo-Pacific and Japan and EU as partners have a great role to play there in actually promoting cooperation, but also including competition and making it perhaps more constructive um, than it could be without EU and Japan as uh, Let's, let's say as moderating forces in the region. Thank you very much indeed, Nabisan, for joining us from Tokyo, Axel from Milan, and Eva from Paris. The conversation continues. Thank you very much. Take care. Thank you very Stay much. Stay safe. Stay healthy. Bye bye, everyone. Thank you, Thank you very much. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye.